Hallelujah. Well, welcome, church. Um, greetings in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Um, switch off the cell, please. It's not a cell meeting. It's our turn. It's our meeting now. Amen. Um, it's just so wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord. And um, really, I've been, I've been blessed by the Koreans. What did you think about that? Clap hands, clap hands for what God is doing. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the church. Many colors, tapestries, but one church praising Jesus, lifting up Jesus. Just one church. Amen. And it's, it's an honor to, once again, to have Dr. Kula, Noma Mukula, with us this morning. In fact, the heart of their ministry is that the church would come together. Partnerships, covenant partnerships, hallelujah. We thank God for what God is doing in your life, amen. And welcome to you again. If you're here for the first time, maybe you're thinking, yo, this is intimidating. You know, these are good people. And I'm not that good. I want you to tell you that. Maybe we have out you ten times more. So feel safe where you are. Don't think, hey, we've been where you are. Tell the person next to you, we've been where you are. But we didn't stay there. Jesus made the difference. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you about a message that I believe is for this season in the church. And um, I've just entitled the message, It's Not All Happening Here. Amen. Say, it's not all happening here. You know, I've been inspired. Once again, um, I love the book of Acts where the church started, you know, the first steps of the church, the book of Acts. I say the book of Acts because it's still being written. It is not completed. We are adding our chapters, amen. The book of Acts. And in that book, I see fascinating stories about how the church began. In fact, it's inspiring to say the least how the church began as a movement of believers. Not just a meeting place on a Sunday, but a movement, glory to God, a movement. They were moving here. The church then understood the mission of the church. They understood the mission of the church. Why the church? Jesus had, you see, one day Jesus in Mark, I believe, Mark 16, had gotten the disciples together and he told them, I will build my church, Mark 16, 18. And the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. So they had a vision of this thing. They had a blueprint of this thing. And then in Acts, you know, they are hitting the streets, exactly doing what Jesus had said. But not only that, they, 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 they really manifested in different things. They presented the gospel in compelling ways. In fact, they didn't just present the gospel. They were the message of the gospel. They embodied the message of Christianity. In fact, they, they feared nothing. They were fearless when they had everything to fear. They would be beaten up for preaching in the name of Jesus, and they would come out and go back and say, thank you, Lord, that we are worthy that we are worthy to suffer for the gospel, to suffer for Jesus. This was the church. Say this was the church. And they presented the gospel. This purposeful group of believers, purposeful, ecclesia, purposeful, moving somewhere, a movement, hallelujah, a movement. Then church was not a building we come on a Sunday, no. This was not church. Huh? 
Church was not a location somewhere in Jerusalem or in East London. That, that was not church. Church was a people with a mission. Amen. A church with a mission. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That was the church. And I'm asking myself, what inspired these people? What inspired them to move the way they did? I went back to the book of Acts. Something caught my attention. Two things. Number one. They were inspired, first of all, by the revolutionary teachings of their master. Say Jesus taught them. Say Jesus taught them. You see, Jesus was, I don't know even how to explain this. In his time, he was a revolutionary. In fact, the Pharisees said he's, he's teaching strange doctrines. As his as and that, that's how revolutionary he was. He, he taught his disciples that devotion to God is measured by devotion to one another. <laughs> he taught his disciples that loving God means loving each other. That, that's how revolutionary he was. Hallelujah. He, he taught his disciples that, you know, it, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're going to profess love for God whom you do not see, but, but, but hate your brother whom you see, distaste your brother whom you see. He, he taught them those kinds of things, to love their neighbor as they love themselves. He, he taught them many things, but they were revolutionary. Yeah? They, they, they didn't understand where is this man coming from with these things. Many times in the Old Testament, they were taught eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Jesus said, no, no, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Huh? If you persecuted, just, just, just praise God. And in fact, pray for your persecutors. He taught them those things. You see, and, and, and they come to the book of Acts. And they are inspired by these teachings of their Lord. And guess what? They begin to practice them. Huh? Not only that, the second thing that inspired them was an event. Just one event. A few days before, huh, their master had resurrected. Amen. Resurrected from the grave. In fact, they, they stopped at, at nothing to tell everybody this fact. That's why they put them in jail. They were fearless. Jesus is risen. Do you know that? A few days ago, Jesus is risen. They would go about preaching. People that not schooled, not schooled in anything. In fact, that was the beginning of their school, if you want to look at it that way. Because up until then, Jesus was fathering them, mentoring them. Now he releases them. Now you go. Now you go. Make disciples. Preach the gospel. Amen. Baptize in my name. Eh? Let the signs be seen in my name. Amen. The church, they were inspired. And yet persecution would rise more and more. More and more persecution. Uh -huh. More and more persecution. In fact, if you read church history, there's a Jewish historian, Josephus. I love his writings. Because he tells exactly what happened, especially under some of the Roman emperors. Nero being one of them. The toughest empire to have survived. You know, um, in fact, Josephus writes that Nero was so brutal that he would feed Christians to lions, living. And these believers were faced with those kinds of atrocities. Needless to say, that they endured, they suffered. Some of them, as you know, Apostle Paul was beheaded for the gospel. Huh? They were sown in two. Matthew was left there at the stake, stoned. I'm talking about 
people who have gone before us. You see, the church is moving. Jesus promised that the church will still move. In spite of all that, the church moved. In fact, again, one of the theologians, Justin Martin, he says, actually, the reason the Roman Empire tumbled was because of the church. It was because of the example that these believers set that it doesn't matter what happens to the flesh, but if my spirit is alive with God, it doesn't matter. There was the church. Say, there is me. There is me. See, when I read there, it inspires me. And I want us to turn to a passage of scripture in the book of Acts. Because I want us to get to the gritties, the nitty gritties of this thing. What, what, what was the church? What was their secret sauce, if you like it? Acts chapter 2. The writer is Luke. Again, Luke was one of the disciples. He walked with Jesus. He knew the heart of Jesus. And then he writes the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. We'll start reading. And he writes the historical beginning of the church for our benefit. And of course, for the benefit of the early church. So that they would not give up. You see, they had a document. And we know that Luke was a doctor. Amen. Verse 41. We want to understand what was the DNA of this movement. Acts 2 verse 41. Those who accepted his message. Prior this verse, the apostle Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, had just preached a message, the first message that was preached to the church, amen, in Jerusalem. So he starts at verse 41 by saying, those who accepted his message, in other words, those who said, yes, I receive this message. I receive this Jesus, amen. They were baptized, uh -huh. conversion, baptism. Say conversion, baptism. About how many? 3,000 were added to their number that day. Say 3,000. Imagine, in one day, one day, 3,000 added. Verse 42, what did they do? They devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. What does the word devotion mean? To give yourself to something fully. Yeah? To give yourself fully in attention. In other words, they understood that as, as near or new believers, they needed the milk of the word. They needed to grow. Amen? They needed to grow. Say they needed to grow. Amen. Not only that, but to fellowship. Fellowship. Say fellowship. The Greek word kononia, a powerful word. It's actually uh, um, is, is, is used interchangeable with the word communion. 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 Say communion. And what does this word mean, fellowship? To share with, to participate with. Huh? Uh, this is not greeting in church. Hey, molom tlegaz. Hey, kunjan. Agushe. That's not fellowship. Ubulisilenje. That, that, that's, that's not fellowship. See, fellowship is something else. It's an involvement, a building of a covenant relationship. Amen. You see, that, that's more than just, you know, hey, friendy, hey, my friend. No, no. Hallelujah. No. More than that. Let's move on. Breaking bread. What we will do later on. Communion. Breaking bread and prayer. Praise the Lord. Verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Hallelujah. 
and all the believers were together and had everything in common. Praise the Lord. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts as we are meeting today. Hallelujah. They broke bread where? I didn't hear that. Please repeat that. Why would they break bread in their homes? I, I thought it's all supposed to happen in the church. Now, what, what is the home about? What, what is the home about? For? For fellowship, thank you. For fellowship. I thought this thing is supposed to happen on a Sunday. See Puma's pearl. And then come back on another Sunday again. Uh-huh. But you see, if you look at verse 42, let's look at verse 42 again. They say they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. If you look at the context there, context is important. Context of fellowshipping with other believers. See, many times we rely on each, uh, what I can do on my own. I rely on what I can do on my own. I will read my Bible. I will pray. I will tithe, we say. But we forget the one another aspect of the new church. Say one another. I understand there's 59 one another's. In the New Testament. What does that say to, to us? If God would say, love one another, be kind to one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another. What does that say? It means there is value there. But you see, I'm this isolated Christian. I will pray alone. I will pray alone. No, I don't, I don't need that company of believers. No. I'm okay. I'm okay at home. I'll, I'll just do this thing alone, you see. That's fine. Just once in a week. That's okay. Is that one anothering? Say this. One anothering means I need to be with other believers. I need to spend time fellowshipping, participating with, sharing with other believers. This is a plan of God for the church. This is a plan of God for my life. I cannot grow to where God wants me to be and fulfill his plan if I remain an isolated Christian. Is that true? Is that true? Then why not clapping? Thank you, Jesus. I cannot grow. You cannot grow. We need each other. Say we need each other. I need you and you need me, the song says. Hallelujah. But these disciples were not just a selfie generational church. You laughing. Yeah, because some of us, really, the social networks have taken over our fellowship, isn't it? The only fellowship we do is, is over the phone. And, 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 and really, that's the only fellowship we know, isn't it? Selfie generational church, but we know those people, are we? We know those people. Say, I'm not that person. I'm not that person. Amen. And now as we move on, there was a time I said earlier on that the church began to be, to be persecuted. Persecution increased. Persecution increased. And guess what? They forgot the meeting part. You see, when the cares of the world come, oftentimes we want to turn away from God. 
you see, Sifunos Valela, Quindause, because things are tough. But the same Luke writes in Hebrews, if we turn to Hebrews chapter 3, he's writing now to believers who have been taught to come together for fellowship and commune with one another. But they are busy turning away or in the, on the verge of turning away because of the persecution that's happening to them. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 Let's, write, let's start from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. It says, beware. Can you see that? Can you see that? Now that's strange. Beware. When last did you hear another believer saying to another one, hey, beware? When, when, when last, in fact, Paul was so audacious, he called Galatians, you foolish Galatians. That's another rebuke. But, but how could they have the audacity to speak so clearly and so heart to heart with believers because of fellowship. It's because of fellowship. See, their lives were one in others. My life in your life, your life in my life. You see, fellowship lets you get away with saying, beware. Appel. You see, you, fellowship helps us. Let me get, not get ahead of myself here. Chapter 12, I mean, verse 12, Hebrews 3, verse 12 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you. He's talking to a group. He's addressing them, not as singular, but as plural. He's saying, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He's talking to believers and he's saying, beware. Why would he, he say to believers, beware? It's because we are, we are liable to fall away. Isn't it true? We can fall away. Say that. Say that I can fall away if I'm not aware of what the scripture is going to say right now. I can fall away. Again, beware, brothers, lest there be any of you, any of you, an evil heart of unbelief. Evil heart of unbelief. He just called unbelief evil. Evil heart of unbelief. Means when I turn away from God, I've, I've just taken on a heart of unbelief. If I stop trusting God, if I stop Having confidence in God. Amen. Another translation says, see to it. Be watching out. In other words, it's a present continuous admonition. Be careful. Watch out. You see, can you say this? When I grow less confident in God, when I stop trusting God, when I turn away from him, because my life is tough, it is tempting to turn away and to doubt God. But the scripture warns me to beware. Now, how do I become aware? How do I beware of what the scripture is talking about? How do I be, become beware, if I, if I may put it that way? How can we become beware? Watch out. Next verse, verse 13. But exhort one another. Say one another. When? Daily. When it is called today. List again the plural. He's addressing believers, not you alone. List 
any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. He's saying the solution for not turning away is for you to encourage one another. And I looked up this word encourage because we sometimes think of encouragement as, hey, you did well, palm shakers. That's not the encouragement he's talking about. Right here, the Greek word for this encouragement is the word parakalio. Para means to the side. And of course, kalio means to call. So it's calling someone to my side. It's walking with someone. Hmm. This is what Jesus did with his disciples. Parakalio. It's, it's not saying, hey, you just greet and you move on. This is life in another life. The only time we can do that is when we meet in homes. We can't do that here. Here it's superficial. This environment is not designed for us, our true colors to come out, is it? I can be the goodie of the goodies here. But but if my life is in your life, I meet with you, my brother, in the context of fellowship with other believers. I've, I've got to show my heart. I've got to tell you, hey, Kobe, pray with me. Stand with me, you see. This is the encouragement they're talking about here. He's saying to these believers, by the way, who are in the bench of giving up because of persecution, hey, Apelani. Watch out, Bazalwan. Yeah? The solution is to come alongside each other. To come alongside each other. Imagine how many things would have been prevented in your life if you had that one another. Just think about it. How many things could have been prevented? How many wrong decisions you could have prevented if you had a faithful one another group. Doesn't matter if it's women, men, but we're missing this communion. This life in another life. Huh? Giving each other permission for my life to be business to you. Yes. Hallelujah. Make my life your business. Make it your business if you want to. But, but if, 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 at stake, if what is at stake is turning from God, then, then go ahead and make my life your business, you see. That, that's what he's talking about here. Not to say, hey, nakinda bazako. Who are you to be in my life? No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. Say this, I need to make sure that I have a one another in my life. Can you say this once again? If these believers are to avoid falling and turning away from God, they need to fellowship with each other. They need to fellowship with each other. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. They need to fellowship with each other. I don't know if anybody um, who has uh, um, really had somebody in their life who, who, who really helped them to grow in the faith. If, if, if you are that person, just lift up your hand. If, if you can you know exactly one person, maybe more, but you know exactly that, hey, God used that person. If, if it wasn't for that person, is there anybody like that there? I'm, I'm one. In fact, all of us. We, we don't come to the faith. <laughs> this is male. It's, it's normally people bringing us, praying for us. Huh? Saying, yeah, you can do it. God did it for me. He can do it for you. Amen? And that, that is what small group fellowship 
or what we call them here at downtown, community care group stars. Amen. That oneness, that fellowship. Glory to God. I'm indebted to so many people. So many people. When, when I got born again, there was this guy. <laughs> His name is Paul Shilakwe. He's in Jobe. He's still my friend. But this guy would phone me. In fact, many times I thought of just hiding and saying, Call me, man. This guy is gone somewhere. But this guy was used to, he used to bother me. That's what I thought. He used to bother me. Uh, and we're uh, uh, to. He would say, hey, Lundi, Lundi, fellowship time. And he used to shout even before he gets to my place. And the leaf, the leaf, the leaf, the leaf, the leaf. Oh, there he goes again. And this guy was, was planting a seed in my life. Of course, I was far away from God then. Far away from God then. And then, of course, um, went to the University of Forte. And another seed was sown there. Uh, uh, brother Scott, I don't know where Mazu Scott done. No timber. Um, she was with us also um, at Forte, at the SEO, the Student Fellowship. Uskotana was a kind of brother. I still miss him to this day. He's late. But Uskotana, we used to come to my room and Gonkos Uskotana and say, Brother Lundi, time to fellowship. You know, with Ella, Louis Rag, and Luke Kayo. And, um, hey, the Gondoba. Did you think the corner? The Gondoba, hey. <laughs> but Uscott and I knew I was there. So he never left. He used to persist. And, uh, oh, brother Scott and I, I honor him because he helped me grow in the faith. We used to evangelize. Uh, uh, um, I remember Uma Mukula here, um, one of the leaders in the SEO then, they used to encourage fellowship so much. Do you remember? Fellowship, fellowship. We used to come, I thought, morning, evening, intercession, on Wednesday, see a puma. We're coming back. We're meeting together as believers. We felt, hey, my God. That, 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 was, that was wonderful. I believe that had an impact in your life as well. Praise the Lord. Amen. Strong fellowship, you see. Not forsaking meeting with each other. For the day of the Lord is coming. Praise the Lord. Can you imagine, church, if you and me just took this thing seriously in 2018? Just this one thing. As you live today, there are people just waiting to register you. There are CCGs all over the city. All over the city. Small groups. Leaders that are inspired of God to help you grow. And of course, you can contribute so much in that fellowship yourself. Can you imagine you becoming a one another to another person? If you're a student, you're struggling maybe in your studies, but you come to a fellowship group and you just lay your life there and you say, God, I put my, my life in fellowship with these believers and I'm trusting you to do something different. A couple. You could have couples fellowships as well. Amen? Of course, I'm not turning away from what you do, my brother. I'm talking about closer-knit fellowship, one with another, couple smaller groups of, of them. You know what I mean? Men the same, women the same. You see, because sometimes the medium-sized ministries have a way of taking away from that where my life is in your life and your life is in my life. 
praise the Lord. One another. One another. That kind of fellowship is what I'm talking about. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As I close, we're going to be taking the Holy Communion. And uh, I would like people that are assigned to play those roles to please um, get ready. You know, believers in the church then, every time they met, we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, one of the things that they would do is to share communion. They would share meals together. In fact, that strengthened the fellowship, the bond. It was like that. We're saying to, to God, God, we are in covenant with you. That's another reason for communion. You are declaring to God, God, I'm in covenant with you. I'm reminding myself that I'm in covenant with you. Of course, in the Bible, um, there's different ways people used to get into covenant. You know, uh, um, sometimes they used to exchange codes with one another to show that I'm in covenant with you. Sometimes they would exchange weapons, you know, like David and Jonathan did. But sometimes they would cut their wrists and rub the blood against each other's wrists as a sign of a covenant. Sometimes they would exchange names, you see. Exchange names as a sign of a covenant. And then, of course, sometimes they would cut animals in half like Abraham did in Genesis 15 and put their halves lying up like that as a sign of the covenant. Of course, and the last way, they would eat a covenant meal. Before Jesus went to the cross, he sits with his disciples in Jerusalem, the upper room, or what was then called the upper room. And Jesus says to them, God wants to establish a new covenant with man. A new covenant. God wants a new covenant with man. But you see, this covenant could not be ratified except blood be shed. So Jesus says to them, for this covenant to be ratified, my body needs to be broken. Otherwise, there is no covenant. There's no covenant without the shedding of blood. We know that according to Hebrews chapter 9. But my blood will symbolize the covenant that I have with you. In Matthew 26, we read. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, symbol of his body. He blessed the bread and he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, I want you to eat my body. I want you to eat my body. Can you say this with me? When Jesus sat on the Messiah's chair in the upper room in Jerusalem, he was entering into a blood covenant with the human race, including me. The only way humanity can gain access to this covenant is becoming born again. It's by trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So Jesus brought man and God into a covenant found in Matthew 26. When Jesus sat down with his disciples in the upper room as the Son of God, he was, he was representing God, the Father. He represented God the Father. in that covenant and say 
God wants a new covenant with you. You see, the old covenant has to be broken. A new covenant has to be reinstated. Amen. Say this, Jesus took the bread and he blessed the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples to represent to them that his own body would be broken for them and that for them to have new life in Jesus they need to partake of the body of Jesus say this I receive your broken body Jesus I receive your broken body that you shared for me at Calvary and as I eat your body I renew my blood covenant with you and so every blessing that comes with this new covenant comes upon me it overtakes me I declare health I declare health I declare soundness of mind this is part of the new covenant as I receive your body Jesus I thank you that nothing stands my way no enemy stands across my way as I partake of your body, Jesus, I'm renewed in this covenant that I have with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may take the body. Symbol. Thank you. Matthew 26, verse 27. The scripture continues and says, he took the cup of wine and gave thanks for it and gave it to them and said, it, excuse me, each one drink from it, for this is my blood, sealing the new covenant. It is poured out to forgive the sins of multitudes. Confess this together. Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples to drink in order to represent to them that his own blood would be spilled for them. Thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing your very own blood for me. Therefore, sealing my covenant with my Father through your blood. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a new life because of your blood. I receive your life, Jesus. As I drink your blood, I renew my covenant with you. The covenant of blessings. No limitations in my life in 2018. I thank you, Father, that as I rise up from this day, I rise up in victory. This covenant has done it all. You, through the blood of Jesus, have completely, you have completely delivered me from every limitation, from every sickness, from every sin, from every disappointment. You, Jesus, through the blood covenant that I have with you, you have delivered me. So I walk now in victory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may partake of the, the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And the moment two people enter a new co a covenant, what that means is that oh brother Kula if, if I'm, I was in covenant with you and we enter this covenant and we enter it and we seal it, it means from this point forward, my life is your life, your life is my life. That's what covenant means. My debts are your debts. Your debts are my debts. That's what covenant means. That's the truth. Huh? My brother, if I'm, I'm in trouble and you don't come and rescue me, you are in trouble. That's what covenant means. Imagine being in covenant with Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the blood covenant. He rescues us all the time. He comes and rescues us all the time because of the blood covenant. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father.